so I'm with the California Institute for Regenerative Medicine. What I'm going to tell you about, so I'm more of an applications person. Now, you've had an incredible overview of stem cells from Dr. Schaefer and, and what they can do and some of their potential in the brain. Uh, I'm an applications person. I, um, until about four years ago, worked for the U.S. Food and Drug Administration in Washington, D.C., working on stem cell regulatory policy. The FDA holds the keys. So if you want to go into the clinic with any kind of therapeutic, you have to go through the FDA to ensure that it's um, going to be a safe and effective treatment. So that is very much what my agency is about. We are about delivering treatments to patients using stem cell-based therapies. So I'm going to give you some very specific examples about things that we are doing to advance stem cells into the clinic for new therapies for, for diseases. So I'm going to give you a, a brief overview of what CIRM is. Many of you may have heard of us. Uh, and so what we're doing in this space, and then I've picked out a handful of our clinical trials that I think will be of particular interest. I'm going to tell you about what uh, some of those approaches and what's going on. This is really cutting-edge research. Uh, California is very much leading the way in this space in, in the U.S. So uh, California Institute for Regenerative Medicine, many of you may, have, uh, may remember this was a ballot initiative in 2004 when President Bush banned federal funding of stem cell research. Um, California decided that this was very important to pursue and chose to pursue it on their own. Passed uh, Prop Proposition 71, which set aside $3 billion of state funds to fund stem cell research just in California, which is a very bold, unprecedented move, um, really led the country and say, we think this is critically important for patients and we're going to invest in this. So we are the agency that was created to administer that $3 billion. So we are purely a funding agency, and we are about funding the best possible science and driving that science into the clinic. So we, we fund, we are, we are actually funding Dr. Schaefer's research, we fund early phase research, but really it's about driving new therapies and, and new innovations for, for uh, diseases with unmet medical need. Uh, so um, our, our programs are basic research, major facilities, translational programs and clinical programs. So when I say when I use the word translation, that's about moving research from the basic research from laboratories into clinical, into the application side. So if I use the word translation, that's what I'm referring to. We have a whole portfolio of diseases in that space. Here's what our portfolio currently looks like. When I say translation, that's things that are, maybe you're within a couple of years, you're starting to put together your package for an FDA filing to say, I'm getting ready to move into the clinic, and then all the way through phase three clinical trials. So, um, so, so that's, this, that's the space that I'm referring to. We currently have 80 active programs in that space at more than $600 million. You can see the spectrum of diseases that we're working in. Um, by far the largest pie piece consistent with uh, Dr. Schaefer's interesting work is in neurologic disease, um, followed by cancer therapeutics. Um, what the, I'll touch on what the relationship there is to stem cells in a moment. Uh, and then you'll, you'll see basically every disease area you can think of endocrine disorders, that's diabetes. Um, eye disease, cardiovascular disease, orthopedics, those are bone and cartilage repair approaches. Uh, and then um, others, uh, autoimmune, a, a, few, a few other areas where we have um, a, a smaller pie piece. So um, just to recap some of the, uh, of the very nice introduction of stem cells that Dr. Schaefer already presented. Um, so he mentioned, he gave you a nice overview about what a pluripotent stem cell is, and then the, which can give rise to all of the cells in, in the body. Uh, and then those can specialize at least partially to a multipotent stem cell, which a, a, a nice example is a neural stem cell that Dr. Schaefer talked nicely about. Um, and, then, uh, and then getting farther downstream, you have more specific cells. So uh, just a, a quick overview of the types of cells we're talking about. Now, um, stem cells can be used in a variety of ways for therapeutic benefit. Uh, so one thing that I wanted to point out, uh, Dr. Schaefer already talked about this. So in terms of embryonic stem cells, fertilization, so one thing that he didn't touch on that I want to make very, very clear in terms of some misconceptions that are out there. Embryonic, this stage of development where you can pull that so-called inner cell mass, which is where we get embryonic stem cells, that is at day four of gestation. So very, very early. So anytime you might hear that um, embryonic stem cells are coming from aborted fetuses or terminated pregnancies, that's absolutely not correct because it can only, anything beyond day four are already too specialized for embryonic stem cells. They can only come from a very controlled environment where you know they're at day four and they're still very, very specialized. By the time a woman knows she's pregnant, you're way beyond that already. Um, so, so these are very, very early stage. 
Uh, so we can derive those into mRNA stem cells. From those, we can derive a whole, a whole range of uh, therapeutic cell types. Um, these are the so-called induced pluripotent stem cells that Dr. Schaefer just touched on at the end, where you can take skin cells, reprogram those to roll them back in time so that they begin to look a lot like pluripotent stem cells, and you can then redirect those to one of these specialized cell types. Uh, my agency is using everything you see on, on the screen. We, we don't believe in picking winners or losers. We believe in funding the best possible science. I don't care if they're embryonic stem cell derived, um, I, so-called iPS cell derived, or one, of, or one of these already more specialized, say, tissue-derived cells. And I'm going to give you examples of all of those today. We want the science to lead where the therapeutics are coming from. Here's the, um, the bone marrow transplantation is stem cell transplantation. This is, we've known about this for um, more, more than 50 years. The, the cells in the bone marrow give rise to the entire blood system. So when you hear about a bone marrow transplant, that is a stem cell transplant. Tried and true procedure now very, very commonplace. And this then, that was revolutionary. Now, embryonic stem cells, some consider to be revolutionary, but the science is progressing very quickly, and I'm going to give you some discrete examples of that. Um, and please, um, as, doc, as with Dr. Schaefer, please interrupt me if questions come along, because I'm going to go through several different disease areas, and there may be particular questions related to certain ones that, that you want to explore a little further. When you uh, talked about the, uh, you know, the day four thing, you said it's uh, very specialized. I think you meant unspecialized? Um, the, they are beyond day four, they are too specialized. That's what I meant. But the, yeah, so you want it to, before they're specialized. That's right. Um, that, that what's unique about embryonic stem cells is they can give rise to every cell in the body. Um, and then what's different about them and gametes is, or, so that the sperm and egg is that they can then also give rise to the tissues outside the body, so the placenta. Um, that's the only difference between what's called a totipotent cell, um, which is an egg. Uh, and then the embryonic stem cell can give rise to everything in the body. Thank you. Uh, so here's uh, an example of, uh, um, there are a couple of different therapeutic approaches that can be used with stem cells. You can use stem cells, the idea of, for cell replacement versus for trophic effects. So cell replacement, that would be an example of a bone marrow transplantation. You're putting that bone marrow in, and it is going to give rise to all of the subsequent daughter cells that it is able, able to produce, which is the entire blood system. Uh, so that is cell replacement therapy. Here's an example of uh, what's using, using stem cells for what's called a trophic effect, where these cells, we know they're producing certain kinds of factors, some of which Dr. Schaefer talked about in the context of, of neural stem cells, where those cells we know are making things that are in some way modulating the environment or changing, affecting the cells around them to have a regenerative or a reparative effect, that we know they can produce things that will be very hard for us to deliver one by one by one. It's a whole cocktail of things they're making in response to their environment. So that's another way that stem cells are being used. You can put in, in this case, this is called a mesenchymal stem cell. They're very commonly found in the bone marrow and in, in fat and in a variety of, of tissues in the body, and they're known to give rise to uh, bone and cartilage and fat tissue. However, they also pr uh, produce this incredible spectrum of, uh, of growth factors in response to a question that was uh, raised previously. Uh, they, they're known to have immunomodulatory effects. So mesenchymal stem cells have been used for, for certain uh, autoimmune diseases to try and tamp down the inflammatory response. There's actually an approved product for what's called graft-versus-host disease, which can arise if there's a mismatch in the uh, immune, uh, the immune stimulating signals that are present of the donor or say transplanted bone marrow versus the host, there can be a, a, a reaction between those two and there's a mesenchymal stem cell based product that helps tamp down that immune system and prevent rejection. That's called graft versus host disease. It's a very, um, uh, very debilitating, potentially fatal disease in particular in children that, that need bone marrow transplantation. Yeah, was there a question here? What, what's that M word in MSC? Is it on the chart somewhere? Uh, it is not here. I'm sorry for that. It's um, I do have it, I believe, in my slides later. Uh, mesenchymal, um, mesenchyme, it's M E S E N C H Y M A L. Mesenchymal stem cell. Um, it, that's, I, I, I'm trying to, to, to avoid the, um, the, the, the science, scientific jargon, so, um, and they're also sometimes referred, they're, they're also referred to as stromal cells, that they, com they, they compose a key part of the matrix and the stem cell niche in the bone marrow. So, yeah, was there one question? Yeah, 
when you hear about restrictions on federal restrictions, I think, on embryonic stem cell research, is that no longer the case? <coughs> line, blah, blah. Sure. So um, the, 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 the brief, uh, the, uh, the, the, the short answer, there's a short answer and a long answer. The short answer is that um, under, actually since the Clinton administration, um, there has there there has not been the ability in the U.S. to destroy any embryos using using federal funds. Um, that is legislation that's included in, in, in the federal funding of, uh, appropriations bill every year. It's called the Dickey Wicker Amendment. It says you cannot use federal funds to destroy any embryos. However, if you have used other sources of funds to create an embryo, so you have to take that embryo, pull out the inner cell mass. Put those in in the laboratory and and grow those up to until they're a, a reliable usable cell line. Once you've already done that, uh, those then can at t different points in time have been eligible for federal funds. So uh, under the Bush the Bush policy change in 2004, he he drew a line in the sand and said any stem cell lines which had already been derived prior to this date can continue to be eligible for for uh, federal funds but nothing new moving forward. Uh, President Obama changed that policy such that the Dickey Wicker Amendment is still in place, but any embryonic stem cell lines that have been created, even after that, that previously imposed Bush administration date, you have to show certain that certain requirements have been met. They can only come from surplus embryos from in vitro fertilization clinics. You can't have any exchange of money, so you can't. It, it can't be. Uh, you, you're not going to create a market demand by we'll pay you to donate your your embryos. They have they have to be donations. They have to be surplus. The couple has to go through a separate informed consent procedure to ensure that they understand what these are being used for. Um, and then um, all this information goes to the NIH, and there's a registry process, and the NIH verifies that all this all the particular criteria have been met. That we know that we know we we know history of the donor. So there's a series of checks and balances. And if all those criteria are met, cur under current policy, they are eligible for federal funds. Okay, um, so here's a, here's a list of the, the current clinical trials funded by CIRM. So we have 12 active clinical tri trials that are either approved and preparing to enroll or actively enrolling patients. The point I want to emphasize is the majority of these were approved just in the 2014 calendar year. That is an enormous level of activity. It's basically taken us since 2006, nearly 10 years, to build that pipeline, to build the capacity, to invest in the research, to, to fund the discoveries. And now we're starting to, to very quickly see these, um, see, these, see those developments getting into the clinic. So this is an enormous amount of activity um, just uh, in, in, in a fairly short period of time. It constitutes a, a significant percentage of the stem cell-based trials that are being, that are being funded using, using public resources in the US. Yeah. Since this is California money, mm -hmm. must this work be done in California? Great question. Thank you. Um, yes. So, um, CERM funds can only be used for research conducted in the state of California. Um, there are a few uh, important caveats to that. For example, a multi a multi center clinical trial, it's not feasible to have the number of centers that you need just in California. So, for a multi center clinical trial. There has to be at least one center in California, but then that being the case, and if, if the trial is operated out of California, you can apply for funds uh, for, for, for those, those external sites. If an entity outside of California wants to apply for funds, to, to serve for funds, they can only apply for the component of that research that will be done in the state. So if they have contract manufacturing in the state, that kind of, so, so we, we are very much about building a the, the infrastructure and intellectual capital and stem cell based economy within the state. That's there. There are taxpayer funds. So yes, thank you. So here's the list of diseases that we're in. Uh, it's it's a broad spectrum. You see um, type one diabetes, HIV AIDS. I'm going to talk about these as well as heart disease and retinal disease. So that, um, these top ones I will be talking about. Cancer, you may think, what on earth do stem cells have to do with cancer? I'm not, I'm not going to address that. The point is, so particular cancers are, have been clearly demonstrated to be the result of a stem cell gone wrong. So many of us know cancer patients that have gone through chemotherapy, gone through radiation, they go into remission, five years later the cancer comes back. Um, very, what, what, it, very likely in, in, in certain leukemias and in certain solid tumors, that's a stem cell gone wrong that's given rise to the tumor. You've debulked the tumor, but the stem cell's still there. 
So we have a number of programs that are developing particular therapeutic approaches trying to molecularly target certain signals on those cancer stem cells that would then be combined with chemotherapy or radiation or one of these more conventional approaches to say, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to target, I'm going to help provide your conventional therapy for that cancer, and then I'm going to go into this more targeted approach to target that cancer stem cell for destruction. Um, so that's what our cancer programs are about, sickle cell disease, spinal cord injury. This was a very high profile trial, started with the first embryonic stem cell trial in the U.S. Uh, uh, Peninsula company, uh, Geron, that was doing that trial that was very high profile. They shut down that program. There's a new company that's been started by some of the key players behind that trial, uh, Asterius Biotherapeutics, that restarted that trial. They enrolled their first patient just a few months ago, so, so we're pleased to be funding that. Retinitis pigmentosa. And then uh, a very recent phase three, this is our first phase three trial, very exciting. That's the last phase before you apply for licensure where you're really trying to show definitive efficacy using an immunotherapy for malignant melanoma. So um, that, that's, the, that's the, the spectrum of our clinical programs. Now I'm going to give you some, some uh, particular examples of some, uh, of some of these particular therapeutics. So type 1 diabetes, many in the room I'm sure uh, know type 1 diabetics. It's a very difficult disease to manage, incredibly costly. Patient compliance is, is a real issue. Yes, you can address the disease by with insulin injections. However, it's incredibly difficult to truly maintain to, to have well-controlled diabetes. You go through these wild peaks and valleys of blood sugar. Um, it's patient compliance to problem, multiple finger pricks, multiple injections per day. It's a challenging and very costly disease to maintain in terms of the impact on our healthcare system. Uh, so uh, what happens with type 1 diabetes? Um, so, so when you eat, uh, your stomach converts food into glucose. That glucose enters the bloodstream. Uh, and then the, here's where the pancreas comes into play. The pancreas is producing insulin. That insulin is critically important to pull the blood, to pull that glucose out of the bloodstream into the rest of the tissues of your body. So that's why uh, diabetics who no, are no longer producing insulin because of the loss of the pancreatic insulin producing beta cells are unable to pull that blood sugar out of their, uh, out of their bloodstream. Uh, and then you end up with very high blood, uh, high glucose levels, which is toxic to many of the many of the systems in our body. So that's type one diabetes. So here's uh, so we are, we have been funding since the early phase research a company in based in San Diego. Uh, they used to be known as Novacell, now they're called Viacite. Developed this process whereby they they figured out how to take embryonic stem cells through this differentiation process and how to become pan insulin producing pancreatic cells. So. Um, and then there, I'm going to show you a picture of this device. So that they're then encapsulating this into a into a device. So uh, what they're doing now is with these embryonic stem cell based pancreatic cells, putting the, those into an uh, an encapsulation device. This is basically a membrane that allows nutrients and glucose from the blood to get into the device. But the pores are small enough that the cells are trapped inside. And then most importantly. The immune cells of the host body into whom you'll implant this device cannot get in. So it's a perfect capsule. If anything goes wrong, you could pull the capsule out. But the, uh, the and these cells they mature in the body and they're able to they know what to do, as you'll see. So this was uh, this was an example from from one of their preclinical studies in animals. This was performed in pigs, where you see so after implantation you've got this really nice network of blood vessels. Those are the host blood vessels that go right in on top of the device. It's filled with those embryonic stem cell derived pancreatic cells, and those blood vessels growing on top of it. The cells through that membrane can sense what how much blood sugar is there, and they're able to produce the appropriate. They know what to do. They know what they're supposed to do. They produce the right amount of insulin. In animals, they cured their 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 animal model of insulin going out two years. How so, large is the capsule? Uh, it's that large. Um, so there it is for perspective. So they're small. Uh, and they've actually made, uh, they, they've got a few different sizes. That's one of the things that they have to figure out in their trial is what the dose is going to be. So they know that they can cure diabetes in animals, but humans are very different. Our, uh, our motility is very different. The, uh, our, our vascular systems are very different from pigs. Uh, there, there are a number of key differences. So unclear exactly how this is going to scale. So this study is currently open. Uh, this is a phase one, two study. Phase one is efficacy. Phase two means it is, oh, I'm sorry, phase one is safety. Phase two is additional safety data and looking at preliminary signs of efficacy before you move into phase three, which is a definitive study of efficacy. Is it actually doing what you think it, it, 
it's doing. So two different cohorts at escalating dose. And exactly to your point, the way they're escalating dose is by adding more of those devices. Uh, they implant them under the skin in the flank, so they're out of the way uh, and just, just right under the skin, blood vessels growing right on top of them, and it immediately, once the cells mature, it takes a couple months uh, once after implantation for the cells to really mature and start producing insulin. Uh, and then uh, what they're looking at in terms of primary outcome, the nice thing is they'll know right away uh, whether or not this is working at, at six months. So they're looking at adverse events over 20 months. Then at six months, you can look at what's called C-peptide. So insulin in the body is produced as a precursor. It's uh, called pro-insulin. And then once it's in the, uh, once it's in the body, it's, in, it's cleaved by an enzyme into two different pieces. One is mature insulin, which is what we all know of and what the, what the recombinant injected insulin that diabetics use all the time is. And then that other piece that's cleaved off is this so-called C-peptide. So they can actually measure that in the blood. And you know that if there's any C-peptide in the blood, it's coming from the cleavage of that new pro-insulin that's been made by the embryonic stem cells. So the one thing that's really unusual about this trial is you're gonna have very clear definitive signs of is it working or is it not at a very early stage, whereas a lot of these trials, for example, for cardiovascular disease, you have to wait years before you know uh, be able to, before you can look at the statistics and know whether or not you're having a significant benefit. Um, so so that's, that's a really nice marker. Yes, sir? So it's a cohort. Could you explain that third bullet? Oh, I'm sorry. Thank you for that. Uh, so cohort just means a patient group. So it means that, um, the, 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 the trial is structured in two different bunches of patients. So one cohort or one group is going to get one dose, which is going to be two of those devices. And then the second so-called cope. So after you've they've enrolled those patients and shown safety, no adverse events, that everything is is going as expected, they would then get approval from their oversight committee. It's called a, a data safety monitoring board that looks. That's a third party group that's going to look at the data in an impartial way and say, does does this make sense? Does it not? Are you not? Are you putting it patient, patients at undue risk? If all of if everything checks out, they would then get approval to go forward with that second group or cohort, which would then get four of those devices, so an in, so a, a, an increasing dose. Yes, sir. Does that capsule keep out the um, uh, immune reaction? Uh, I guess T cells or whatever they might be, or do you take immunosuppressive drugs with this? Or there's so um, right now the model is no immunosuppression that, that it, it is immunoisolating. Um, that the, the pores in that are, are so small, small that proteins and sugar and insulin uh, can, can get through, but, but cells cannot. Uh, but certainly that, that, that is definitely one of the things that they're working on is an immune response. Because ultimately, this is a foreign body that you're, putting in, that, that you're putting in, and there will be some kind of a generalized immune response to that. So, so that is definitely being looked at. Is there another question over here? What about patient comfort? Itching? Uh, Mm. Sense of discomfort. So that's always captured within your standard, with, 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 with in typical what are referred to as adverse events. Um, there, there's a series of, uh, there's a tiered system of classes of adverse events, and th that's something you always have to report to the FDA. Any kind of uh, pain, swelling, redness, itching, those are usually um, uh, basically considered minor adverse events, but they're all reported. And at the end of the trial, you look at the spectrum of those and say, okay, is this normal as a result of the surgical procedure, or is this maybe indicative of, of something bigger going on? So yeah, those are always carefully monitored and reported to the FDA. Yes? So uh, are there issues, there probably are, about scaling this up so that you can have enough of these cells, assuming this worked, for however many type 1 diabetics there are in the world or in the United States? It's a great question. Um, that's really a question that we would need to direct to the business development okay. team at Viasite. <laughs> um, it's, it, it, this kind of therapy, there, there is no business model for it. There's, okay. there, there, you know, it's, um, it's theoretical. Yeah, it's right now that we're, we're in uncharted territory in terms of these complex combination products. It is one of the inherent challenges of <laughs> Uh, of cell-based therapies is they have really high manufacturing costs. Uh, it's very difficult to demonstrate, to show. A small molecule drug, for example, you can analyze using very rigorous laboratory methods and you can definitively say, I know that I have my one compound at 99.999% purity and you can show you have the same thing time after time after time. These are dynamic living systems that are changing and responding to the environment. So how you characterize them is very challenging and very expensive. So um, it's something that if it works, I'm sure that they will they will figure out how to do that. So. 
Yes. So presumably all these devices are identical. I mean, they don't put, you know, they don't have secret sauce or different types of people. Or no, whatever. no, no. You, you, the FDA won't let you get away with that. <laughs> um, so, so there, there are. Uh, there, there are particular clinical studies that are done on what's um, sort of individual patient by patient approaches based on no options or unmet medical needs. They're, they're, they are tending for this to be a scalable process. So they, they've developed a manufacturing process to, to make that device and they had to prove to the FDA that they can do that consistently and the same every single time. So, yeah? Uh, this is a private company, right? Uh, they're publicly traded. So as they're using public funds, is there any discussion on regulating or um, anticipating as they scale up that they benefit from that and how much it's going to cost the actual user or the patient? Is there any relationship to that? Um, so are you talking? Are, are you talking about reimbursement, like Medicare or healthcare costs, or? Or money coming back to the taxpayers, that's what you're asking. If this is such a wonderful thing, and you've done something like that, if it's such a wonderful uh, solution for type 1 diabetes, and those people need it, uh, what's the price going to be to those that actually did pay the tax, tax money for them to find out this nice uh, solution mm -hmm. to that? So is there any discussion about that line of progression from research to yeah, using the results of that publicly funded user. So any contract that CIRM signs with a grantee, we do retain some piece of resulting products intellectual property. So if there is a commercialized product that um, is, has been developed using CIRM funds, some piece of that does come back to the California Treasury. What piece? I can't discuss that publicly. Um, each one of those contracts is negotiated individually. Um, and honestly, pretty frankly, with the, with the case of the Viasite contract, I don't know what the specifics are. Um, Does it go back to CERN? It goes back to California General Treasury. So no, it's it's I mean it's 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 not intended to be a self-sustaining thing. It's intended to be this is taxpayer benefit. Any res, any resulting revenue should should go back to the the, the General Treasury. And that's decided for. That's right. So, and we actually we actually retain um, we we uh, that's often included in our academic projects as well. Um, that the idea is if you if you're an academic sponsored phase one clinical trial, if you're going to get all the way to a phase three, you're going to have to have a corporate partner at, at 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 that point. Just the the scale, the problems, the costs associated. That's not something that uh, an academic entity can typically support. So, and, and we are very working with, very actively working with our programs to help them look for partners. So, so we are envisioning, we're not envisioning any of these are just phase one trials. We want to ensure that these are projects that are going to move forward. So, um, okay, so uh, moving on here, uh, I want to talk uh, for a minute about um, HIV AIDS. So, uh, some of you may have heard about a so-called Berlin patient who was basically cured of, um, of, his, of his HIV. Uh, and that is inspired stem cell based therapeutics. So HIV uses as its uh, HIV one uses as its receptor um, a protein called CCR5 to get into the CD4 positive T cells. Um, that's a particular population of T cells that are most affected by HIV, and this is what they need to get in. So the idea is um, that there there are certain individuals out there. There's a naturally occurring mutation that truncates a piece, of, there's a, a piece of this protein that has been deleted just in normal development, um, and those patients are not, not susceptible to HIV-1 infection because they do not have that receptor expressed on the surface of their T cells. So that was very cleverly utilized by um, a particular physician treating the, um, the, the so-called Berlin patients. This was an individual um, that had a very serious, uh, that had a very serious um, uh, leukemia, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, lymphoma, um, and uh, no, I'm sorry, I was right the first one, sorry, it was leukemia, uh, um, had, had very serious leukemia, and needed a bone marrow tra transplant, was also HIV positive. So his physician had the very clever idea, he said, well, wait a minute, I will, I'm going to give this guy really high dose chemotherapy, it's going to wipe out his bone marrow, he's going to need a bone marrow transplant anyway, why don't I look and see if I can find a bone marrow donor that's compatible with his immune system that also carries that mutation in that CCR5, CCR5 receptor 
I might be able to cure his cancer and his HIV all at the same time. Um, and that's exactly what happened. Um, so it took a long time for a, a, a lot of screening to, to find that individual, uh, went through the chemotherapy, um, so uh, what basically white does bone marrow, the transplant was with a, uh, a C, from a CCR5 negative donor, and the result was he was then CCR5 negative. It recon successfully reconstituted his entire blood system, lacking that CCR5 receptor, and he's been off anti he was off antiretroviral drugs at, at that time. This was reported in 2008. As far as I'm aware, he's never gone back on antiretroviral drugs and never detected HIV in the system. Um, so, uh, incredible innovation, however, not a scalable model because you're not going to be able to find bone marrow donors carrying this rare mutation that are compatible with the immune systems of all the different individuals you would need. Plus, this is somebody who's going through a high-risk procedure anyway. You're not going to myeloblate HIV-positive people and uh, bone marrow trans uh, that, that high-dose chemotherapy regimen to wipe out their bone marrow and a bone marrow transplantation it's a very risky procedure for a disease that at this point is readily controlled with antiretroviral therapies and HIV positive individuals live very long lives with their disease under control. So the risk benefit calculation there is, is very challenging. But the bottom line is uh, that, that very striking result has elicited a whole series of research programs that are trying to learn from that and figure out ways to utilize genetic, up to apply genetic engineering technologies with stem cell based approaches to affect the same response. So one that I'm going to be telling you, uh, so we have a program using this approach where they're using a particular kind of enzyme called a zinc finger nuclease. This is a naturally occurring enzyme that you can then engineer those to, they're like molecular scissors. They'll go in and cut DNA in a very specific place. In this case, they've engineered to cut at that CCR5 receptor. It, all it does is cut, and then the body's own repair mechanism for cleaved DNA uh, goes in and says, hey, the DNA is cut here, that's a problem. It, your body knows how to go in and fix it. That, that repair mechanism is fairly error prone, and often when it, the, the repair mechanism that goes through results in a mutation that often inactivates then this receptor. So you end up with the same result as that deletion that we, we, we know is naturally occurring. So you can affect the same outcome. Uh, another approach is using gene therapy, introducing uh, what are called uh, siRNAs or small inhibitory RNAs. And what those will do is they can target the, uh, the destruction of the, the message for a particular gene. So uh, they're using that same approach to, rather than cutting this, this DNA, actually expressing a, an inhibitory protein that's going to result in the expression of that CCR5 going away. So the outcome is the same, the mechanism is a little bit different. Is the, CC, is the CCR5 receptor on the, on the cell's membrane useful for anything? Uh, that's beneficial? It's, it's dispensable. Um, so it, it's what's called a chemokine receptor. So it responds to certain chemical signals in the environment. However, there, it's, it's a whole family of receptors and they're promiscuous. You, there's some cross reactivity between them. So where if, if it goes away, others can still have carry the normal function that it would have. So if, you're, if you have that deletion, there are not profound effects on your immune system. Uh, so uh, so the, the second approach is using that, uh, a combined approach using this um, siRNA, but then also delivering a particular, um, a particular protein that inhibits the ability of the HIV virus to fuse at the, with, the, with the cell membrane and enter into the cell. So that's sort of a, a two-pronged approach, targeting both the ability to recognize the cell and the ability to enter in the cell. So those are two different approaches trying to learn from the uh, the Berlin patient, and here's how it's being used by a company that we're funding called Calimune. Um, the zinc finger nuclease uh, pro project I mentioned is being done by an academic lab based at, uh, at the City of Hope, uh, down in the San Jose area. So what you do is, so you're, so the patient comes in, uh, they're given a growth factor called GCSF. Uh, what that does is that mobilizes to, um, certain cells to come out of the bone marrow. It's a signal that's normally produced in certain situations to tell your bone marrow, hey, you need to activate, you need to put certain cells into the blood. Uh, those cells are then collected. There's two groups of them, the CD4 positive T cells, which I've already mentioned, which are the target of HIV infection. And then these are C34, that is a marker of the blood stem cell. It's called the hematopoietic stem cell. It's what gives rise to the bulk of the blood system. 
So you're pulling out both the mature cells and you're pulling out the immature cells and going through that engineering process that I just mentioned. So you're changing, the, uh, you're making that change in the stem cells and in the T cells, patient specific treatment here. Um, and then you, in, you infuse those back into the patient. They're looking at this from two different ways. I mentioned the, the importance and risk associated with that chemotherapy regimen to wipe, to, to basically uh, get rid of some of the patient's bone marrow. They're, so one of those drugs is called busulfan. They are using, they're using two, again, patient cohorts, two different groups of patients, some that are not getting any, any amount of chemotherapy regimen, so their bone marrow still is totally intact. And the idea is that um, this engineering will provide those cells a competitive advantage over the cells that are not susceptible, uh, over the cells that are susceptible to HIV infection. A different population of patients are getting a low dose of, uh, of chemotherapy, so it's what's called making space in the bone marrow. So you're not wiping out all their bone marrow, but you're getting rid of some of it, so that because the key aspect is that you need those blood stem cells to reside in the bone marrow. You need them to take up the normal stem cell niche or the environment that they occupy so that they can resume that normal biological function. So they're looking at it both ways. They don't know if this is going to be necessary and they wanted to see if, if indeed it is because that affects the risk-benefit calculation of this particular treatment. So where are they? Um, they um, so they're doing a phase one, two. This is called an open label study. So a little bit of clinical trial jargon there. So a blinded study is no one knows who's getting what treatment. You know that um, it's a patient comes in and they've been told you might get a placebo control or you might get the therapeutic and you're not going to know because we need to ensure there's no bias. Uh, the, we know the placebo effect for certain diseases can have a profound effect. So that's, that's blinded and double blinded is the investigators don't even know which treatments are, are being delivered. That, that there's, it's a two-step process. In this case, it, because of, because of, um, of ethics, you, you, you can't go through this procedure without delivering the therapeutic. There's, there's too many risks associated with it because these patients are going off their antiretroviral therapy. So every patient enrolling is going to get the actual therapy. That's what makes it open label. Um, with, I mentioned with and without busulfan, a total of 12 patients. Primary outcomes are, are safety and feasibility. And then uh, the secondary outcome is what benefit does that, is that busulfan providing? Is it necessary? Does it make a difference in terms of HIV-1 levels that are measured? Uh, and then, so the first patient was enrolled in July of 2013, estimated study completion uh, uh, December of next year. So this is very exciting research. And then, as I mentioned, we also have another trial that's getting ready to enroll that's at a pilot phase using just that zinc finger nuclease strategy that's based on, um, uh, with, with, that's academically sponsored uh, in partnership with the company that's developed that genetic engineering technology. Um, I want to quickly go through a, uh, a cardiovascular disease approach that, uh, that we're funding. So after a heart attack, uh, you have an acute infarct. So this is looking at a cross section through one of the heart ventricles. This white region is the scar that results, and that's what results in the uh, loss of cardiac function after a, after a myocardial infarction. So uh, um, over time, that then uh, that infarcted region gets thinner and elongates, and then over time, uh, then it. The, the ventricle gets wider, and it's this changing of the shape of the ventricle um, that really ha has pretty profound impacts on cardiac function. Uh, so, so that's what it looks like after a myocardial infarct. And so, so there's a, um, a group uh, that is working on a, using a cardiac-derived stem cell. So you already know that there are stem cells that reside in particular tissues that help give, that are, have a more specialized, they don't have the ability to give rise to every tissue, but they can help replenish. So you have stem cells in your skin, for example. We know there are stem cells in your heart muscle as well. So uh, uh, technology was developed, so they actually take from a donor cadaver heart, they, uh, essentially pull, dissect out that tissue, and they're able to isolate this particular population of cells called cardiospheres. And those are then derived into cardiosphere-derived cells. And this is, you may recall, a, a few minutes ago I talked about having direct effect versus an indirect effect. So are you having actually looking for cells to take up residence in that tissue and take over the tissue and actually restore it? Or are you looking for cells that are maybe producing certain factors that elicit more of a remodeling response? This is an example of the latter, that we know that these cardiosphere-derived cells are, they're providing certain factors that are important for, they're, they're a signal for the heart to remodel itself. They're not actually uh, engrafting and, and remaining in that tissue. 
Um, so in their, uh, in their initial phase one trial in humans, they're looking at, so this is looking at a um, cross-section of the ventricle. So this is the heart, this is the heart wall. So um, these are the, this is treated with cells. This is, tr this is controlled, just a saline injection. Now, uh, in this case, white is bad, black is good. Basically, this is MRI imaging. Uh, scar tissue shows up as white. So you see in the control, this white region here, that's the scar, that's the infarcted region, that's the scar. And so, so you see that in control, and then after six months after therapy, the control, you still see this white region of the heart, whereas um, that is resolving in the case of six months with the cell therapy, and when you quantify that, you see a significant difference in terms of the reduction in scar size with the patients that, that have been treated with, with the cell-based therapy. So where is that? That is currently in a, in a, um, a company, uh, Capricor, that was based, out, um, it was a company that was spun off out of an academic lab uh, in, uh, in the Los Angeles area, Cedar Sina. Uh, so ra randomized again, so, so he, in this case, this is double-blinded placebo control. So no one knows what they're getting. Uh, and you're, it's either a placebo or the uh, saline injection or the cell therapy, uh, multi-center trial. Cardiac trials are very large because you have to look at differences in six minute walk tests and certain functional outcomes. So they necessarily have to be large studies to get the statistical power necessary. So they have to enroll 274 patients. This is a pretty significant trial uh, across 25 centers, uh, uh, four weeks to, to, to 12 months after their heart attack. Uh, they've already completed the first, the first group, the phase one, 14 patients, and their phase two is enrolling, looking at that MRI outcome that I, that I showed you and estimating uh, completion of, the, of this study um, as early as uh, end of this year. So that's a very exciting trial that we're happy to sponsor. Uh, also, uh, last thing I wanted to touch on was eye disease. Many of you know eye individuals with retinal disease. My grandmother has uh, macular degeneration. So very exciting uh, work going on to treat retinal disease. Very debilitating, it, loss of vision has a significant impact on quality of life. Uh, so macular degeneration, um, age-related macular degeneration, this is dry AMD in particular. The mechanism is um, due to a, basically this membrane layer at the back of the eye and the base of the retina gets sick. It's not behaving in the way that it's supposed to be. It has a normal function where it's gobbling up um, toxic, Thing, uh, uh, waste byproducts that your photoreceptors are producing to keep the environment pure. And over time, these waxy deposits known as drusen start to accumulate in the back of the eye, and that's what then obscures vision right, in the case of AMD. So it's, it's an issue with, with this basement membrane layer here. So, uh, and, and that layer is comprised of what are called retinal pigmented epithelial cells. So, uh, and this is what it looks like uh, under dry AMD, you end up in, within this, the central field of view under uh, this obscuring of the vision. So, uh, we have a group that's using um, embryonic stem cells to derive those retinal pigmented epithelial cells, and they're putting them on this, this interesting nanofabricated scaffolding material. So, the significance is it's a very thin region that allows for free diffusion of all the nutrients, proteins, um, blood, oxygen across that layer, but then they've used this thicker mesh to provide the structural support that's necessary for them to implant it in the back of the eye and for it to remain there. So, what they then figured out how to do was differentiate uh, embryonic stem cells into ret retinal ep pigment epithelial cells, which is what you see here, structured on that scaffold. And then when you section through it, so here's the scaffold here. Um, this is what you see in the normal retina, where there are these very polarized cells that have what are called cilia, these fibrous projections at the top. So these look very um, histologically and under a microscope very much like normal ret retinal pigment epithelial cells. So they're implanting this in the back of the eye now. This is the, these are um, their animal studies. So looking at a larger view, you see the scaffolding looking through the eye, sitting in the back of the retina. And then when you look cross-section through the retina, this bright white layer, that's the scaffolding. And then here, looking through histology, there's the scaffolding as well, uh, interfacing very nicely uh, with, the, uh, with, with the layers of the retina. Uh, and they've, in animals, they've shown restoration of vision. There's a, a, a test whereby you put rats with retinal disease in a box that has uh, a rotating carousel around it that has black lines. And the normal response by rats is when they see one, their head tracks as, as those lines are going around. And you can quantify the difference of normal rats versus diseased rats. And uh, using this implant approach, they saw a restoration of visual function, at least by that test, in rats. 
So they are now preparing to uh, um, their their IND or investigational new drug application. That's the process you have to go through with the FDA has been approved. They're going to be preparing to open a phase one two B trial uh, <laughs> with patients uh, in uh, late stage AMD, which is called geographic atrophy, due to dry AMD soon. So that's very exciting research. Uh, so um, just wanted to go ahead and wrap up and uh, just a few final notes. So basically, we are uh, really very quickly starting to realize the promise of stem cells and moving therapies for very serious diseases into the clinic from phase one trials all the way through our recently uh, recently funded and approved phase three trial. Uh, some of these trial results we expect are gonna, are gonna be coming this year, some will be a few years out, but still we are, uh, we are very much moving these therapies into the clinic. Uh, and then we have, we have changed a number, a number of our processes. So we used to do annual submissions to come in for funding. We have now moved to a rolling process so that we can accept grants on a monthly basis. The issue is the, these kinds of development programs, if you're ready to go into the clinic, you need money yesterday, not 12 months from now. So the idea is we're trying to be much more responsive to the pace at which the field is accelerating and changing our timelines accordingly. So with both the advances in the science and how quickly things are moving and our ability to now keep pace of that, we're, we're anticipating doubling the number of our clinical programs hopefully within the next year. So very exciting to, to see this level of movement. Um, and I want to thank you for your attention. Welcome to any questions or questions. Uh, assuming no uh, governmental slash legislative changes, will this money run out at some predictable point? Uh, so right now, so uh, we have spent roughly $2 billion of the $3 billion. Um, and uh, so we, right now, based on our current burn rate, uh, the last few grants would go out the door around 2020. Those are multi-year outlays, so CERN with existing funds and no major changes would continue to exist in some capacity until, until 2023. So we still have we still have a, a lot of good work to fund. Yeah, in the back. Are there any uh, plans for uh, clinical trials coming up for uh, other neurodegenerative diseases, specifically multiple sclerosis? Um, you know, MS is a really challenging one. Um, it's so uh, so we do not uh, we do not currently actively have uh, programs in MS. Um, the MS is there's there's a real delivery problem there that we know that there's an issue of demyelination, but it's systemic. So how do, in the case of say Parkinson's, we know what region of the brain is affected, and it's okay. How do you develop the right cells, and how do you deliver them to that region of the brain? When you're talking about needing to deliver something to the entire central nervous system um, that poses a, a much broader challenge. There's a lot of great work that's more in the, in the early phase right now trying to figure out what, you know, what, what those delivery options might be. So there's, a, there's a lot of good research going on there. It's a little bit upstream because there's some of the fundamental biology that, that still needs to be worked out. So very active area of research, near term clinical trials, most of what I'm aware of are more things that are looking at more systemic modulation of the immune system rather than actual cell-based replacement therapy, per se. Uh, yeah, in the back. Can you say more about that malignant melanoma uh, therapy that's in phase three? Uh, you know, so um, that's what, quite frankly, I'm, I'm not familiar with the specific. Literally, it, the, um, the contract was signed a week ago. Um, it's, 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 it's brand new. Um, uh, it, it's so it, it's it, so it's an immune therapy. It's basically it, yeah, it's an engineered immune cell to target malignant melanoma. Um, beyond the specifics of that, I'd be happy to get your email address and get some specifics and send them to you. Yeah, in the back. <laughs> um, you had said something uh, in the beginning about how important it is role. Is, do you have any information about what other states may be doing? So nothing has ever been comparable to the level of investment that California made. So very shortly after Proposition 71 was passed, when the Bush administration's uh, federal funding restriction was still in place, a number of other states passed other stem cell based initiatives. Uh, I believe the high watermark was somewhere in the order of 15 states had some amount of a stem cell program. Um, many of them were subject to annual appropriations. They were within the normal state budget, unlike ours, which is three billion of state bonds that was a set aside that um, that was there dedicated for CERM until those funds were exhausted. Um, so many of those programs have been zeroed out. Uh, once NIH changed their their once President Obama changed the NIH funding policy, um, they said you know, um, many of those programs have been 
zeroed out, yeah. Um, so the uh, Maryland still has a program. Uh, the New York Stem Cell Foundation is kind of an interesting public-private uh, partnership model. Um, there, there are a handful of other states that, that still have programs, but nothing of the scale that we do. Yeah? To follow the last uh, research you've been doing, but the layman, how do you want to follow that? Is there a website or uh, I mean, this whole macro degeneration? Yeah. Um, so uh, we work with a number. I mean, I'd be happy to take any to take your contact information and put you in touch with specific, specific groups. One that would, would be great to look at is the Foundation Fighting Blindness. Um, they're uh, a very good patient advocacy group um, that, that are that are very active in this space. Um, there are a handful of others as well. Our communications director, um, uh, Kevin McCormick, is our lead in terms of interfacing with patients and patient advocacy groups. So he probably has some other specific groups that can refer you to as well. So I'd be happy to connect you. Yes, sir. This is also more or less a funding politics question, but can you give any idea how many proposals are rejected and uh, you know what what could be done with, with more funding? Uh, so yeah, that's that's a good question. It's um and it there's it depends upon what what stage of development. So our, our early phase research programs are quite competitive. We'll get hundreds and hundreds of applications um, to fund uh, maybe 20 or 30 in a particular round. So uh, at the basic research phase, our funding rates are maybe not dissimilar from the rates that are, that are seen at the NIH. Um, now, when you're talking about these about the clinical scale programs, there's a lot fewer things that are coming through the door uh, in terms of that have gotten to that level of readiness that they're going to be that, that, that they've we, we require certain eligibility criteria to come in for projects at a certain stage of development because we these are very large awards they're very expensive programs and we expect them to have maybe already met with the FDA and had uh, official meeting minutes come back so we have ways to evaluate whether or not they're ready and if they're not if they're not ready we might encourage them to come back at a later point in time so mm -hmm. so the numbers coming through the door are, are much much smaller as a result if they're actually ready and they've checked those boxes they're likely to be much more competitive, so the funding rates may be higher um, in, in, in those rounds. Uh, and, and that's changing now that we're, it used to be a, sort of a once a year call, now that we're moving to monthly, it's you know, a, a smaller number of applications coming in on a, on, on a rolling basis. So the statistics, will, will, we, we don't have enough, that just started in January, so we don't have enough numbers to know how that's impacting it. Yes. So do you have a commitment then that if you fund a phase one or phase two, you'll see it through to the phase three? No. Um, so, well, so you can't possibly anticipate what the results are going to be at a phase one or phase two. There's an enormously high attrition rate going through clinical trials. So uh, you come in for, the, the proposal is a discrete set of activities. And that's what's, we have an external scientific advisory group that are all outside of California. So they have no stake in what we're doing. They're evaluating purely the quality of the science, feasibility, uh, the, uh, the expertise of the team, essentially trying to assess both whether or not that project can be executed, and whether they can complete those activities in that set of time. And then, let's say they complete their phase one, we would welcome them to come back. If they meet, their, if they meet the, uh, the, the primary objectives of that study, we would welcome them to come back in and say, okay, now you can apply for your phase two. And that was within exactly that point was one of the drivers that led us to change from an annual submission process to a monthly because you can't know when those results are necessarily going to come. And when you're ready to go, you're ready to go. Uh, so we, we want to be able to respond to that. Yes? Um, on the diabetes research, would you remind us of the name of the company and the name of that product that's in the trial? Sure. So, so, so the, name of, the name of the company is Viacite. Biocide. Yeah, V-I-A-C-Y-T-E. Okay. Um, I can send you a, a, a link to their website. Okay. Um, it's uh, the name of the product. It's uh, it's uh, some letters and numbers. Uh, it's in my slides. Uh, VCO1. But there, there was also like a trade name or something for that for that device. So the, the device is called Encaptra. En Encaptra. That's yeah. Encaptra. But that's purely the device. That's not the product with oh. the cell. Okay. Are they still enrolling patients in trials now? Yeah, so, so they, um, they just enrolled their first patient um, at the end of last year. So uh, yeah, they, they, that, that trial is actively enrolling. I, I want to give you my contact information. Sorry. Sure. Okay. Yes, in the that device, if, if the patient is giving himself insulin, how is that going to, to give out insulin? 
adding it all the time to the bottom. So, so these patients go through, there's a, a, a weaning procedure where basically so you get the device, it takes the device a while to mature, um, and ultimately um, they're, they're monitoring blood sugar with a, um, uh, they're part of the trial is monitoring what the insulin dose is. So, so the, um, essentially they're, they're specifically tracking what, if any, contribution of insulin in the body is coming from the device. Also part of that is they can calculate that based on the level of that peptide that I mentioned, C-peptide that they're measuring, because the amount of that in the blood would be directly proportional to any new insulin that's been produced in the body as a result of the device. So clearly, this is a topic of compelling interest, um, and I hate to bring it to a close, um, but I do want to thank Dr. Whittlesey.